du gå så tak tak bak ved at have det, der må jo blive det. Ja, en anden fik jeg PowerPoint, en anden fik jeg ikke tre sekunder i går. Åh, men nej, hvad de fejler, der er en mulighed der. Ah, this one. Ja, det er så godt. Yes, and then there's a yeah. Okay. So what you hear see here is a what do you call demonstration of what happens when you uh, have a soft materials and you press stuff, impress stuff on it. And it's uh, compared to the uh, shapes you see mm. in the rocks in uh, the Andes. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see also where it's pressed, the surface is more compact and the rest of the surface is uh, like with more texture, uh, so it's more flattened. And this, uh, yeah, it goes really quickly. Uh, I think I wanted, I wanted just to do it another time. This also explains the scoop method uh, in the end. Or explains, demonstrates how it could have been done. I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm going there. <laughs> no, I said I missed it when I No, 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 no. That would have been like a really radically fast explanation yeah. of how we made it sound. Uh, because there is a major issue here. And it's good that you asked that question. Because this harks in on that. Um, um, yeah. Um, it would be possible if it was all limestone or something like that. Limestone, if you have an acid, you can dissolve it and you can soften it and uh, maybe do stuff with it. Uh, but it's in any type of rock. It's like in these igneous rocks, uh, a granite, you know? It's never been taken out of the ground. It's just a rock outcrop out of the mountain, sticking out of the mountain. Uh, so they didn't soften it before. Uh, an interesting thing is, and now I'm just going to go into like, how did they do this? Uh, and I'm not going to totally explain it. I'm just going where, where I can go and it, after that, it's just there's a lack of information and a lack of knowledge, maybe, from my part. Because I'm not like some super uh, physics uh, guy. Uh, these, are, these are the uh, two Pataras at Silustani. They're also made of yeah, huge uh, megalithic blocks that fit together uh, perfectly with knobs and, you know, the thing. And uh, uh, these blocks are hollow on the inside. I don't know if all the blocks are hollow. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I haven't seen any other, uh, but I think this might be a clue. Uh, yeah, the, here I have to uh, credit uh, Jan Peter de Jong uh, again because he's done a lot of research on uh, the uh, concept of the like shimmering layer on the stones, not to be that they're polished. But that they're actually, uh, what is the uh, English word? Vitrified. Yeah, vitrified. Um, and uh, vitrification uh, can be done by intense heat. Mm. But uh, then you would ask, what would cut the stone if the stone is extremely hot? With what medium are you going to cut the stone that's not going to melt into the stone? Um, yeah, well, these are the examples that point to that it might indeed be uh, a, 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 a sort of vitrification uh, in a process we don't yeah, know exactly how they did it but you can see that there are a bunch of layers on top of each other and if you polish it if you like scrape the top layer off it will be rough stone again but if you vitrify it there will be a couple of layers that have changed like the, the mineral structure has changed um, here you can see uh, uh, this this is this one is this stone and it seems like you like they, they softened it and then you put like two fingers through it like like it was clay or something yeah it looks like that i don't know if it was done like that it looks like that and you can see really on this stone also there's like uh like an edge so this is a flat surface and here is rough stone and here exactly is where it's like vitrified or polished and it's like a straight edge it's like they put the yeah, like I, I said in one of my videos, they put the uh, Vitrifier 2000 here. 
and then they vitrify it, and then they, they I don't know, with sticks uh, or whatever. Uh, more examples. Uh, more examples. And oh, there's a whole Facebook set. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> <coughs> and um, yeah, but I still have to go to internet to show this. Uh, this is a very important part. Um, the edges of these perfectly fitting stones are the most vitrified. So this vitrification process, or maybe softening process, uh, could be the way how they get these extremely tight fits. I mean, this is this is Saxe Roman. These are stones that weigh thousands of kilograms and have this tiny little corner precisely fitting there. Yeah. You, yeah? Can, you can't put a paper. Or yeah, it's just yeah. you try it. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a really nice anecdote. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, here you can see that indeed with Saxe Roman, you also have this uh, uh, like with the I, I think these 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 examples speak for themselves. Here's one side they completely fit refined slash polished. Um, so here comes the test. Um, yeah, Jan Peter de Jong went there, uh, chiseled off a little part of this vitrified stuff, went to the univers university in uh, Utrecht. And in the university in uh, Utrecht, uh, you can say that they, they, they uh, analyzed this stuff. And uh, these are the results. So uh, the results is that, um, yeah, that you can see that, that there are uh, like two distinct regions. This is the vitrified part, and this is the like not vitrified part. Uh, and they they uh, yeah did did a spectral analysis, and basically they can uh, see what the uh, like composition of elements uh, is in uh, the minerals in the stone. And um, yeah, this is the spectral analysis. It's a long story. I did it one year of chemistry, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, and um, yeah, what they found is that there are uh, different uh, concentrations of elements in the outer layer of the stone, uh, which in, in, in the outer layers of the stone, uh, like the, the, the vitrified or uh, yeah, the vitrified layer, uh, we could now kind of say, um, that um, there were a couple of things that, that they got from it. Uh, different elements in the outside uh, layers. There's different composition and can be uh, because of uh, intense heat, this can happen as a reaction with the atmosphere. But the elements were so different that you, you would not say it was a reaction with the atmosphere. You would say there was some paste applied to it and maybe after that heated because uh, they they met uh, the the body of limestone somehow merged melted with the surface layer and this seems like some ceramic te technique you apparently can do with many types of stone uh, that we don't <coughs> that we don't know of we don't know of such a ceramic technique we don't know how to how to melt uh, igneous uh, diorite uh, in, in a way uh, that we can uh, with with some dissolvent I don't know exactly. And then, then you can cut it out as, 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 in, in an easy way. We don't know this. Um, so this is how, how far I think this thread can go. If I go farther, I go to lots, lots of physics stuff. I don't. I have to like study for ten years to really uh, like no 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 that's too much. But I I don't know more from here. Um, but anyways, so this is like where this is a, a, an important. Uh, research result. Yeah, the other one should have. Uh, uh, oh, I'm in the I'm in the thing again. Yeah. Yeah, I just. Look. Oh, this is oh, this is different, but okay too. Uh, yeah, so more of the uh, stone softening theory, also by uh, the same guy that had the uh, critique on the uh, Nova. Uh, building small pyramid uh, field work and uh, yeah he shows some examples from, from Egypt uh, as well uh, where you can see it's like patchwork that they put maybe soft stone slurry on it okay some other crazy places because uh, now I want to like expand uh, a bit and, and just and just uh, snoop around a bit uh, like what are other anomalies 
uh, seeing that this is like a really weird that, that we saw. Um, these are the biggest blocks ever, ever made in, like, in, a, in a building in a wall. And uh, the uh, regular theory is, is um, yeah, it's done by the Romans. And I just want to say something. If we, if we got like this Egypt, uh, a Peru thing a little bit wrong, um, and, and uh, 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 yeah, we, we've, we've got that wrong, then maybe we've got a wrong framework for human civilization. And it's interesting that, uh, like lately, in the last 20 years, uh, there have been multiple uh, sites found around the globe uh, of, of human settlements dating back into the hundred thousands of years. Yeah, and so humans were like, like completely populated the planet a uh, hundred thousand years ago and not like uh, 5,000 years ago uh, the Polynesians and uh, 5,000 years or 10,000 years ago uh, the first people to cross the Bering Strait into the north of America and uh, and then there was this this they found in the Philippines a hundred thousand years they found in South America 60,000 years 40,000 years stuff like that um, so uh, this paradigm is, is changing and then we're like okay we have a 200,000 years of uh, a, like a, a, a modernly uh, like, a, like, uh, exactly the same humans as we are that are smart creative uh, and and how long does it take for a civilization to to rise and fall not very long like look at this <laughs> civilization uh, what was uh, the longest civilization in history that we know of oh it was the Egyptian civilization it was there like 3,000 years yeah, like this, that's, that's an interesting thing. So anyways, uh, Baalbek, it's in Lebanon um, and uh, it has these huge blocks and there's only one place where uh, you can also find similarly-ishly huge blocks uh, and that's uh, beneath the Temple Mount. They're the lower, lowest courses of this entire this is the Temple Mount. I don't know if you can envision the structure. There's like this wailing wall there and it's like really high. But below that, there are layers of stone deep underground. There are these huge blocks. These blocks weigh uh, like a, a million kilograms. And they fit perfectly together. And uh, uh, regular theory says it's built by the Romans. But the Romans have no account anywhere. And I, if I was a Roman, I would boast it. Like, we the Romans built that. <laughs> okay? I would boast because it was a lot of work, you know? <laughs> I would boast. But nowhere there are accounts like we built Baalbek. And I, I think why they didn't write it down, because they didn't build it and didn't want to, like, of course. <laughs> uh, so, uh, a couple of kilometers from this place, there's a quarry, and in the quarry, first there was like, soil like this, so only this st uh, stone was sticking out. Um, and this stone weighs also more than a million kilograms, and it was probably used for this building. Uh, and you would think like uh, uh, the, the regular story was the Romans left it there because it was too big to take. <laughs> well, I mean, you cut it in two. You cut, you cut it in half and you take half. And yeah. this is okay, but this is yeah, too big. Yeah. And so it's, a, it's kind of a weird, it's not, it's not a pra pragmatic Roman thing to do to just leave that stone there. You know? Um, so, uh, and also if you look at it, if you know what Roman structures look like, they use big blocks. Uh, but they uh, made like these, uh, and they made like these, what they, what they call bosses on it, like these little, these thingies that come in front, like these surfaces that come up. This is Roman on top. This is different. It's a different texture. It's a different, it's a different uh, amount of erosion. It's different. And why would you build like this and then sudden, suddenly continue like this? It doesn't really make any sense. So uh, there's a lot I can say about uh, this uh, site, but I'm like just like okay, giving you options to investigate. Uh, another very interesting place is um, like the question is still how old is all this stuff? And and they say well it can't be older than than uh, five thousand years, like three thousand BC or something, uh, because that that was the dawn of civilization. That used to be the paradigm. Uh, but there were already like things like mm, we're not sure but there was was no exact dating because you cannot date stone well what's up this site this site was deliberately buried uh, like 10,000 years ago or 9,000 years ago and because of that they have like a whole sedimentary layer with exactly the same type of rubble in it 
And uh, because they have this really clear layer, they can do carbon dating from this layer because they, they, they can see it's been buried. So there's like one specific moment that, that all this material accumulated. And then you can do uh, a carbon dating. Normally, like, uh, uh, like uh, yeah, I used to, it's, it's a bit of a, a bad example, but I still use it. Uh, if I go to the Notre Dame, you know, right now, right now, and I really have to take a dump. I take a dump next to the uh, Notre Dame. That's my carbon material, yeah? And then I, I take a piece of stone and I scribble in the Notre Dame, Casimir built in Notre Dame. Casimir the Great. Oh no, that's another guy. Casimir <laughs> uh, built in Notre Dame. And then, like, sediment uh, comes there, and uh, some archaeologist comes, and he scrapes the ground, and he finds the, the, my graffiti, and, uh, and, and he analyzes my poo, and then it's like, yeah, 2,000 years ago, Casimir was here, and he built the, the Notre Dame. Yeah, that's, that's not how you can do it. But when, when the carbon is in such a layer that is, uh, like, this shows the deliberate burial, you can analyze this carbon and get, like, like very specific results and these results show that the uh, earliest uh, <coughs> circles the, the, there are stone circles made uh, with megalithic pillars and there are about, like 50 circles uh, there uh, at, or 20 to 50 circles uh, at the site uh, these are like heavy uh, heavy stones and uh, yeah here you can see more of the site uh, there like there are beautiful uh, carvings in them as well and here you can see uh, like the earliest dates that, that come out of uh, testing show that it, it's uh, uh, 9,700 uh, before uh, Christ when, uh, yeah, so 11,700 years ago uh, is what the uh, carbon dating uh, indicates, the German Archaeological Institute, Klaus Schmidt. So anyways, uh, this is the Sphinx. And the Sphinx uh, is interesting, it's been hewn out of the limestone plateau. So the plateau was like this, and it was a small outcrop. They carved this, its head out of the small outcrop. Uh, but the most of the Sphinx has been cut out of the limestone. So the limestone has been taken out. And they made this uh, like limestone uh, temple of it with huge, yeah, I don't know if it's a temple structure of it, with these huge blocks. And later they dressed it with granite. And you can still, I think, and, and you can still see the imprint of the granite blocks. But they took it off to build mosques and stuff like that, because it's yeah, you already got the stone, so why, like, why bother quarry, quarrying new? So what's interesting about this uh, place is that uh, um, the uh, the box where the, the uh, Sphinx is being cut out in uh, shows specific weathering patterns. Uh, and uh, yeah, in the desert, uh, there's very little rain, so you would not accept uh, yeah, uh, or uh, expect, expect uh, such a weathering pattern uh, as been done by rain. And there's a geologist, so I think he is from Boston, I'm not sure, his <coughs> name is Robert Shaw, and he in the 90s came with his theory like, yeah, uh, well, uh, this box shows uh, weathering from uh, like uh, lots of rain. And the last time there was lots of rain in the Giza Plateau was uh, like uh, 7,000 years ago to uh, 11,000 years ago. He gave like this a bunch of possible options, uh, but, but not during the dry period. Also interesting to note is that, and you can, you can see it, uh, uh, the Sphinx was buried in sand up until the time Napoleon came there. You can, you can see it, this part was exposed, but this part was all buried in sand. So the entire thing was also buried in sand when they found it. And, but at some point in history, lots of rains created this pattern. And then was said, yeah, let, let, good for you guys, geologist guys, but we already have the story about wh wh which the Sphinx uh, belongs to. And there's no other civilization that is, uh, yeah, that is that old. Uh, but yeah, you can't date, date stone. And, and now there's this, uh, yeah, uh, Gobekli Tepe thing going on and some other stuff going on as well. Uh, yeah, this uh, this one I got from uh, like following Graham Hancock, so credit uh, to him for uh, yeah, and Robert Shaw uh, of course for pointing out this this yeah, it can't be because there are no other civilizations. Uh, but then they found Gobekli Tepe, and uh, yeah, then more th more and more things are uh, on the discussion on the table. So I uh, yeah, I'm reading this book by Graham Hancock now. He's got a couple of books. Uh, I really like it. 
uh, because it's it's like uh, he he, he uh, has a lot of sources. So it's all like uh, of course it's his story, but it's all based upon uh, just really like scientific research, uh, and that's why I really like it. You can really like dive into it and see like how how good is this source. And this is an interesting thing. It's I'm not sure exactly what the type of stone. Does anyone recognize the type of stone? I forgot what the type of stone is. Okay. It's a hmm? onyx. Onyx. It's possible. Yeah. Or j jade. Jade. Or jade. Obsidian. Smaragd. Smaragd. Okay. It's it's a beautiful type of stone. And uh, but this thing is I forgot exactly. But it's I think it was forty thousand years old. Uh, and they found it in some uh, some cave. And this is not uh, something that is smash. This is something with really precise stonework. And where uh, did they find it? In America? Uh, I think they found it in the Denisovan cave in Siberia. Okay. Yeah. If I'm correct, I'm not entirely sure. But if you look this up, yeah, yeah. like the <laughs> the internet is quite full with it. So. Uh, uh, Plato and the Younger, dry, younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Okay, the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis is a hypothesis of a comet uh, hitting Earth at the end of the last ice age. Uh, and there's just lots of geographical, uh, ge geological evidence, I have to say, uh, for it. That clearly uh, shows that there was a mass melt of glaciers. Um, there are other, what they call impact proxies, things that show that there was an impact uh, by uh, actually a, 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 a comet uh, that, that broke into a lot of different pieces and then uh, as a sort, sort of debris field like hit uh, the uh, ice caps of Northern Europe and Northern America. Um, and you can see like uh, uh, the, the pieces of uh, like soil uh, that, are, that are melted because of this, like there's a whole layer of ash in the um, in the in the sediment, stuff like that. Um, also, I'm not going to explain. Just check the theory. Uh, but uh, this impact um, falls together exactly with the account of Plato of when Atlantis was, and it uh, comes together also uh, exactly with the start of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, correlation. I can go into the Atlantis story. I will not go into the Atlantis story. It's a long story. Uh, basically, the interesting thing is that they were also good with stones and uh, they were highly advanced civilization. Um, and that the story of Atlantis uh, originates from Solon, who lived, I don't know, a couple of hundred years before uh, Plato going to Egypt and getting the story there from some Egyptian priests and then Plato writing it down and to then us Westerners saying no it was it was not a true story it was his fantasy or whatever uh, this is an interesting thing this was a um, and it's, it's what I want to point at like then why don't why don't we see all these uh, 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 like uh, where, where where are all the ancient civilizations now if there were 200,000 uh, years of ancient civilization. Where are they? Why don't we see them now? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question and um, um, they, could, they could all be e easily destroyed, wiped away by many different forces and uh, the earth is not that safe as we think it is. Uh, this was in, I think, 1910 and it's called the Tunguska uh, explosion and it was a comet that exploded over a really uh, like uninhabited area uh, but if it had exploded over uh, a big urban center, there would be uh, a, a, a like the, the whole economic system would sh would shatter. And if it and it was a small, it was like I don't know, I don't know a bit, but it was a really small comet. So if a big comet hits, uh, I don't know, uh, some some ice sheet, uh, the the water levels can go up within. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. If you look at the, 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 like the, the flood story and other legends, I'm going to legends, yeah. Uh, if you're going to like the flood story, it says it's rained for seven days. The skies became dark and it rained for seven days. What happens if all these really hot comets hit the ice sheet? And it rains for uh, seven days in a row. Um, and these myths, if you go into them quite clearly, 
uh, all around the globe describe uh, massive floods and uh, basically the story of uh, humankind abusing their uh, creative powers for their own uh, selfish uh, stuff, not for the cosmic uh, greater good. And uh, then uh, the gods came and say no more. Uh, and uh, they save a small uh, group of people who are still doing good. And they can make a boat or go to uh, the, the special hill with the ant people and uh, survive on their meager food and stuff like that. Uh, like, like I really liked uh, um, like the, the Noah Ziwa Sudra uh, is is very linked. Uh, it's like with the uh, yeah, it's the flood flood myth with the, making a boat. And uh, you've got the Edfu building text. They go they go together with Atlantis and also with the uh, Viraskochas and Quetzalcoatl uh, and Akpalu, uh, which are like the bringers of knowledge after the flood. And th this is also a reoccurring theme, like uh, some. Uh, and and you could imagine what if the right now uh, there will be there will be like some planetary collapse and the oceans would rise uh, I don't know 80 meters and uh, 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 who would survive like we we in urban centers are used to have like transport routes and that this would all be destroyed yeah who are who are in the business of surviving on a small scale yeah some other ga hunter gatherers they're like oh yeah the, the sky is dark and uh, there's less uh, less fruit of that will take roots and then some people with their smartphones and a charger who, who escaped the carnage <laughs> come there and, and, they're, and they're, they, these people know stuff. These people know stuff and they will, and, and this, this will the seed for like the next civilization too. And you can see that it might be like cycles of civilizations uh, on earth being destroyed by, I don't know what exactly what forces. Uh, it, it could be the gods or it could be nature, nature. <laughs> or both. Uh, so similarities between uh, these uh, things and the interesting thing is so it's, it's about symbols It's about codes. It's about geometry. This is a huge new field. You can go into uh, It's it's a, a less concrete hard empirical of course than where I what I started with I really like the stuff that I started with because it's uh, Yeah, it's it's just it's just there and it's not very subjective and this becomes more subjective, but uh, the uh, it's what's called the, uh, the, the the little handbags or the man bags. Uh, is, is it men? It's mostly men wearing them. Um, yeah, here you can see them on the stone in Gobekli Tepe. Uh, here is uh, is it on I think one of the Akpalu and this uh, Mesopotamian. Uh, this is uh, Quetzalcoatl in Mexico. And also the uh, symbolism of the feathered serpent or these uh, therian tropic uh, 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 like entities like uh, they, they have they have like a, a body of a human and then a, a head of uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, in this in this case a fish it's also where the mitre co my, mitre comes from you know Santa Claus and the Pope they also have this thing on their head. Yeah, and also uh, uh, in the hand is the pine cone, and the pine cone is also yeah. This this goes this. <laughs> I'll I'll just I'll just stop here, okay. <laughs> but the pine cone is also in the Vatican and on the staff of the Pope, and this is and in the Vatican there's some stuff that's like pretty, not even reminiscent of ancient Egypt. That's like hardcore ancient Egypt. Uh, processional numbers. Uh, we go into numerology, uh, stuff like that. The procession of the equinoxes is the um, uh, orientation of X, Earth, uh, the Earth's axis uh, uh, when you like, uh, yeah. Uh, and of course, um, it doesn't really matter for day or night, but it matters uh, like uh, um, what, um, like a sign of the horoscope, what, what, what uh, Stegebild, what's it in English? Sign? What sign of the horoscope uh, comes up in the morning before the sun? Something like that. Yeah, uh, at the specific uh, time of the year. And uh, you can measure, therefore, this procession of the equinoxes by measuring what star come up. And if you put a stone in the ground like this, and you put another stone where you sit exactly next to, you can like really precisely measure, ah, now the star is going above the stone at exactly the corner. And you can, through these stone structures, you could really, like stone circles, for instance, are perfect for that. 
It's, it's like, it's like a, a sort of a measurement clock uh, for this precession. And um, this precession has to do with certain numbers, and the theory is that these numbers are incorporated in uh, the ancient structures that were uh, built uh, by, by like, like people that still retain the knowledge of the uh, ancient cultures uh, that were before uh, the, the, the cultural boom we experience now. Uh, so these are a few calculations. Interesting thing that 360 degrees in a circle, if I'm correctly, was also in Egypt a thing. And then you get specific numbers. So if you say, uh, like how much time does it take for the Earth to rotate one degree uh, like around its uh, orientation of the axis, uh, for the Earth axis to rotate one degree, uh, that's exactly 72 years. And then uh, I think uh, this is Borobudur, which has exact. This is Borobudur, and that's exactly uh, 72 of these uh, pillars. Uh, 55 is also uh, uh, like uh, uh, yeah, connected. This is like the, n the numbers you can you can see that they're uh, connected. It's like if you count this, this is the same step. <coughs> so. Um, yeah, these systems of measurement, are they ancient or, uh, or not? And I'm not going in there uh, too much right now because I just want to see, give an idea of what's out there. And this is like my, uh, more my own stuff. So uh, if they're not tombs, because we think the, the pyramids are tombs, uh, but empirical evidence uh, shows that uh, like, how many mummies were found in pyramids? Uh, one in some obscure rubble pyramid. And for the rest, there were, there were no mummies found in pyramids. It's a theory. It's a theory. And I get the theory, you know. Uh, like uh, back then, 18, like 1800 uh, AD, uh, some French uh, archaeologists with their paradigm looked at it and said, yeah, this is like some big monument for some big guy. Uh, and this is, this is his, his coffin. Yeah, um, so, but when I look at it with, with a more like a uh, comparative, like what do we see, what else do I see it with these geographical questions, um, I think they are a lot more like uh, devices. They're like extremely precise and in a certain geometrical shape. Okay, what else things, things that we have here in this reality or this culture are extremely precise with a, a high, like with a certain geometrical shape. Well, it's uh, like instruments for measurement, instruments for playing music, and instruments uh, for medical purposes. Uh, so I would say, uh, if you compare it like that, it is a, uh, yeah, a, a, a sort of a uh, uh, instrument of some sort for learning, for conveying information, for receiving information, um, um, for, for healing, uh, for making music, I don't know. Um, and um, yeah, so that's why I think they were, they were built for a, a practical purpose other than uh, placing a dead person in it. Um, yeah, so there's this interesting correlation, you know, the uh, Orion, uh, Orion correlation. And uh, yeah, this is of course again a, a whole new discipline because I don't know exactly about uh, like physics of uh, toroidal vortices and uh, frequencies and stuff like that. Uh, I'm super fascinated by it. Um, if you look at this pyramid and you uh, like and, and you if you would cut it like the big pyramid, if you slice it in two, you would have the, you have this. And the internal structure, uh, this is the inter internal structure of the pyramid. And if you uh, su superimpose a uh, septigram on it, you get this shape. And there's something interesting about that. Let's see, what, what I, I think I put this video here. Oh yeah, I'll, 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 oh hell, again. <laughs> yeah, so what, what they're doing here is they're, um, 
they, they, they put a pipe and the pipe, uh, they sing in the pipe and the pipe is connected to, I think, uh, another piece of pipe and on top of it they placed a uh, piece of skin of some, of some sort and on, that, on top of that is salt sprinkled. I think it's salt. Yeah, 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 indeed. It's called cymatic phenomena, and it's how vibrations organize yeah. a medium. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing of it is that uh, this organization it does not come randomly. It becomes uh, in uh, like uh, that the vibrations have specific uh, mathematical ratios, uh, exactly like uh, you have in music. You know, yeah, there's a right. there's a, a tone yeah. uh, scale, and they they have specific ratios to each other. And the interesting thing is that we can hear as a human uh, if, if two tones are uh, harmonic with each other. Uh, we have like this is false and this is not this is not false, but it's mainly when you compare it that one tone becomes false. If you start in a false note, the next note has to be the same false and you can play a whole thing in false and then well oh, it sounds kind of okay. <laughs> but if you start like doing false and not false, it's like oh. Uh, so you can hear like okay these these um, these uh, vibrations have the same, uh, have, have, are harmonic with each other, have the same type of harmonies. Um, and um, I don't know if you heard about the uh, um, Mr. Imoto water experiments from Japan, yeah. uh, where they have like, okay, if you have a certain uh, emotional intention, the crystallization process in the water is differently. And of course, uh, the angles found in these crystals are all uh, kind of the same angles uh, because of the way uh, just chemically it works. But why the crystal is every time dif different, why the crystallization process, which is of course a huge thing, uh, a crystal is, is, is like uh, uh, billions of molecules, uh, but why exactly this crystal is formed is maybe because uh, the way the crystal forms is being influenced by certain vibrations, emotional vibrations, sound vibrations, consciousness vibrations, uh, if there's such a thing. Um, so that's what I like, uh, that was really would like, this is like, uh, some, like a, a, a sort of a, a fantasy thing that I uh, really like, that uh, maybe it was for exploring consciousness, uh, the pyramid, and you can, you can lie down in a certain vibration, you know, the, the monks would go in there and they would like chant the whole day and then the whole pyramid would be like buzzing because it's like one perfectly fitting stone structure so the vibrations get like uh, what do you call it they have no uh, nothing dampening them yeah, yeah. yeah so and then the whole thing would be like buzzing and then then you like prepare with meditation or whatever you think is the best way to get in a, a higher state of consciousness and then you go into the pyramid and lay down in, in one of these chambers and uh, have a great experience or a really bad experience <coughs> There are a lot of stories about people going into the pyramids and having supernatural experiences. And Napoleon had a really bad experience, I, and I could imagine, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's this whole story about him not wanting to talk about it on his deathbed. And, and, and really, I wanted to show a little bit more about the precision. And um, this, I, I, I'm not going to the, to the site. Uh, this is uh, the Queen's Chamber. Uh, and uh, superimposed upon it is the king's chamber. So this this is the queen's chamber, and the king's chamber doesn't have a, a uh, roof like this, but has a roof like this. So it goes like this, and they're exactly the same. This kind of precision is inside of the great pyramid with these granite blocks, 
and it's 2.2 million stones with bronze chisels in that amount of year, <laughs> and it's 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 just mind mind boggling. Um, yeah. So I think this was. Uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. If you if if uh, anyone says as like uh, no the pyramid is was built because there is. Uh, yeah, I put this thing here, but it's not important. This was my uh, thing. Whoa. Whoa. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, uh, anthropology. How? Uh, what? What are the knowledge for anthropologists to, uh, well, uh, complete it into the whole story, but especially okay. the story of. Uh, um, why people are building massive buildings like this? We say in our Western mind of thinking, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of work. Why would you do? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 religious purposes. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, uh, super uh, superstitious. This is the kind of this yeah. is the kind of thinking. Just art. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just art? Yeah. No, no. I wouldn't say just art. It's just not art for the no, sake art. of it. No, it's it's uh, art with at least with. Uh, According to most people, it's art with a clear purpose. It's not like this random, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, that you can, you can, uh, like the, these art movements of like early 1900s. So you call it impressionism and stuff like that. You can, you can like, like create. No, it's it's uh, according to specific rules. There are clear rules within uh, within at, at least the Egyptian art thing. Um, yeah, and just art for a pyramid is for me a, a strange concept, but other stuff, yeah, just well, art. Yeah, then you go to the okay. basic of what, what is art. And yeah, oh yeah, that's, 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 that's a really hard thing. That's why I think about yeah. anthropologists, they yeah. think on a different way than as a technical person making yeah. a building. Yeah, so, like, I haven't, like, read all the all this stuff that's out there, so it. it's really difficult for me to answer this question with, <laughs> like, but what I've gotten from it is that the reasons for taking so much time for building a pyramid or or uh, um, like like making making like yeah, yeah taking so much time is about like uh, or taking so much time making a really precise structure is about uh, yeah these were the royals these were the royals so therefore